We're going to the Congo. Now, in the 1500s, there was a kingdom called Congo, uh, but that kingdom broke up. The river that ran through uh, the kingdom of the Congo is also usually called the Congo, although this was a Bantu-speaking uh, kingdom, and they used a different word for it. They called it Nizir. And that's where you get the word Zaire from. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is on the south side of the Congo, the Congo, it's the old Belgian Congo, used to call itself Zaire. It's the north side of the Congo that we're more interested in. That's the old French Congo. The Congo River itself is the second largest river in the world in terms of discharge of water into the ocean. <clears throat> now the reason that you get to that is largely because it is also the deepest river in the world. In some places it's like uh, 700 feet deep. And the result is huge amounts of water can be discharged out into the ocean. Now, there is a point along the Congo where there is a large uh, pool or lake 
to, uh, it's called the Stanley's Pool, after uh, Stanley and Livingston, you know, the uh, Henry uh, uh, Morton Stanley, uh, who was in this area at one time. Um, but it's kind of like the Bodense, or Lake Constance, if you will, on the Rhine River. It's a fat place in the river. And on the south bank of the river is the capital of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Kinshasa. On the north side of the river is the capital of the Republic of the Congo, Brazzaville. Now, a lot of times when you see Congo written uh, in a list of countries, after the word Congo, in parentheses, they'll have Brazzaville so that you can tell that they're talking about the Republic of the Congo, the old French Congo, instead of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the old Belgian Congo. But Brazzaville is a rather strange name for an African city. The word itself is not from an African language. Instead, it is French. The town is actually named after Pierre de Braza. Pierre de Braza was probably uh, the most important 19th century French explorer, but someone you may never have heard of. He's very similar in many ways to the British explorer Sir Richard Burton. He could uh, pass himself off as a part of the indigenous population in many parts of Africa, just like Sir Richard Burton did. Now, he was the person that in the late 19th century made his way back through rivers into this part of the Congo area, in this part of the Congo Basin. He took a very small group with him, only a handful of interpreters and soldiers. Mostly he went with textiles and trade trinkets. And he went in to talk to the king of the northern part of the Congo area. And he convinced the king that he wanted to put his kingdom under the protection of France. Now, at this time, a lot of the European countries were gobbling up parts of Africa, and the African king saw some advantage in getting the protection of France from the other European countries. Also, that would increase their trade and perhaps increase their influence in the area. Eventually, de Braza becomes the French governor of this particular area of Africa. Now, there were problems uh, when he became governor. There were reports getting back to France that the natives in this area were being treated too good. And he eventually was removed as governor and replaced by another one uh, who was not so easy on the natives. In fact, there were complaints then that the natives were being severely exploited. And around 1900, de Braza was sent back in to the Congo uh, in order to be able to do an investigation of the people that had been put in there to replace him. And it turns out uh, that his report was extremely damning, but he never was able to present the report himself. One of his lieutenants had to do it, and the reason is because on the way back, he died. Now, I'm not sure just exactly why he died, but it seems to be a malaria-related death. There is a memorial in Brazzaville to Pierre de Braza. The locals just loved him. In fact, 
they loved him so much that when they went independent, they kept the name of the city Brazzaville. Now one thing that's odd about uh, Brazzaville, and for that matter Kinshasa, uh, is that uh, it is uh, upstream of some rapids. And that means that boats cannot get from the Atlantic Ocean to either city, although both cities have good communications with the interior. So this seems like an odd place uh, to put a, a European capital in Africa. Now this isn't a non sequitur, at least not entirely, although it's going to seem that way. But the best restaurant uh, in town uh, happens to be uh, Mama Wata. And it's right around the corner from the Radisson. Now, you might think Mama Wata is a, a, a local name a, a, from a local language, but in fact it's English, and it means Mother Waters. It has a reference to an African uh, water spirit. Now this water spirit, uh, curiously enough, uh, is famous for uh, seducing young men. And it's very popular uh, all throughout Africa. Now since the main international airport is at Brazzaville, that's where we're landing. Hi, fellas. I know. And I don't pay to ask. We're in our third government in two years. So, you are guy? No way. I stay at the airport. Supposedly got Monroe Kelly. Is he good? He's very good. He's also very late. Whoa, whoa. Oh, oh, shit. Now what? What's that? I haven't got a clue, but why do I feel like this airport's just. You know what that is? You know what that is? All right, give me a passport. Excuse me, but we'd already arranged for a guide. Robertson, Robertson Reynolds. Robertson Reynolds, yeah, I fired him. You what? Robertson Reynolds, a bird watcher. I hired Robertson Reynolds. You would. Have you any idea what's going on in the Congo as of the radio show this morning? The Kaigani have had it with Zaire, and they're eating people. You go in there with Robertson Reynolds, and you're coming out somebody's bowel movements. There you go. Now, wasn't that easier than going through customs? The Congo has long been known as a volatile hotspot for crime and armed militias. With increased dangers, the team must be extra cautious. From guerrilla warfare to the local animals, uh, to just the hazards of being on an unknown river, uh, there's always danger involved. Border here, guys. Feet of water. Yes, we don't want to go any closer to the Congo. The team is exactly where they want to be on the river, but just 100 feet away is the border with the dangerous Republic of Congo. Problem is we're getting a little bit too close to the Congo side. We don't want to get too far over the front. This is what they call the frontier river uh, because it could cause uh, more sorts of complications for us. We're at a deep part of the river, 15 feet, but we can't stay here because it's uh, politically sensitive. Gibbons and Mullen believe the major reasons why this animal hasn't been found is the remote location and the threat of searching in such a dangerous area. Yes, we have to go. Okay, let's go. They are very close, but cannot take the risk. They reluctantly head back to camp. Despite what you've just heard, uh, Congo is perfectly safe. Well, perfectly safe may be hyperbole. The fact of the matter is there are some uh, small dangers. I'd hold the set. It drops all the way down to the bottom there. You can see another hole at the bottom. And uh, that hive has been there for about a year now. A year and a half, maybe. Uh, and one of the ones that I want to talk about is these bees. Uh, these are African bees. You remember the Brazilian scientist who crossed African bees with uh, domestic uh, Brazilian bees and came up with killer bees accidentally. Well, this is what made the Brazilian bees into killer bees. So be careful. There are, in fact, many social insects uh, back in the rainforest. Uh, one of the ones that you're uh, very familiar with, I'm sure, is, is termites. 
I'm not used to seeing termites in the open. Why are these in the open? Because it's quite cool here. There's no, um, there's no direct sunlight. You know. Now there's a group of ants that I want to turn to that attack and live off of uh, termites. And these are called Matabele ants. And uh, those ants uh, are uh, named after a tribe uh, in Africa, uh, similar to the Zulus. The Matabele ants uh, both bite and sting, and they uh, go around in fairly large groups, so be careful. For the tribe or faction of um, and now there's two possible reasons why they're named after the tribe or why the tribe does what they or what the tribe originally did for their for the city you know, 50 or, or 100 men and they'd go out and they'd raid a village steal their cows steal their goats steal their women and booze and whatever else and um, then come back to the to the main main homestead with their loot and party on before the defenders of the area could come through so they would raid the into the Zulu territories because the Zulu was a the Zulu were a kingdom they had a uh, an almost centralized war force, a defense force. So before the, the defenders could rush out and um, kill the, kill the offending, offending um, Matabilis, the Matabilis had already taken everything. Much the same as these guys, who when they come into a termite mound, they will just grab and sting, because they have a very powerful sting, and it's a paralytic force. If you come really close to here, and blow on them, it makes a sound. You're going to ruin your video now. Just come stand on the side here. As they, they walk in a straight line, but as soon as you blow on them, they'll start spreading out a bit. So get down a little bit and listen very closely. Get down yeah. Amazing. That's another reason why they're named for the tribe. Or the tribe is named for them. Cool. Metabilians. Yeah, they forage in the termite mounds for food. Mm. Their primary source is <laughs> worker <Yeah>. termites. <laughs> that is what I'm going to do. <laughs> Let's just say, me and, and Uncle D. <laughs> we go way back. We go way back. Now, the Matabili ants are not the uh, ants that uh, are most famous in Africa for uh, stinging and biting. Uh, those would be the driver ants, which, as you can see, are considerably smaller. But they're extremely aggressive, uh, and uh, once they latch on, they're not going to let go. As a matter of fact, they don't sting you uh, immediately when they uh, get on you. They usually look for a tender spot, and they can make elephant stampede by going up the elephant's trunk and stinging it from the inside. Because they bite and won't let go, you can use them for sutures. If you have a wound, uh, you can put a uh, uh, you can put a uh, an ant uh, up on either side of the wound so that it's when its jaws close, they act as sutures. You can spin the body off at that point, and the head will stay in there and uh, not fall off until the wound is healed. 
I was telling my guide uh, about the Azteca ants in South America that hide inside this inside the Cecropia tree, uh, and he told me about some ants that were very similar in the area. So a few days ago, you were telling me about the Cecropia plant in South America with the hollow stems that ants live in. This here is our African version. It is called the Bacteria pitulosa, or Bacteria tree for short. I picked a little leaf from uh, another plant here. A piece of foreign material. I'm just going to activate these ants a bit. See if they go a bit quick on the ball now. They're not too bright, but uh, they're quite strong. Come out. So I'll be able to pull that off. I should be finding that leaf sure shortly. Work together. So the bacteria ant has evolved with this, with this tree. Oh, there he goes. And will defend it. Now, if that was a caterpillar, they would be stinging it as well as trying to push it off. But biting and stinging uh, ants are probably the, the least of your uh, concerns if you're back here in the, in the Congo. Uh, a more important concern is the tsetse fly. And uh, they are very numerous and very aggressive and they are not deterred by insect repellent. I did a little research before I went back in there and uh, I discovered someone that said that uh, vanilla extract uh, might uh, prevent uh, flies from biting you and so I took some with me and in fact it does seem to help. Oh and by the way uh, these tsetse flies uh, probably are not carrying sleeping sickness. Uh, the locals say that uh, they don't have sleeping sickness back in this area. So you might say, well, what happened to the lions? There used to be lions here. Uh, this used to be a savanna. Lions like savanna, but it is converting to a, a rainforest, and lions are less comfortable in a rainforest. Also, uh, uh, large apes and large cats don't get along well together, and there are a fair number of gorilla and chimpanzee in this area, so the lions might have been constrained a little bit by that. but. What most few people think happened to these lions uh, is that their prey uh, species had been hunted out by the local people. And uh, the result of that is that the lions were starving and the result of that was that they became man-eaters and the last few lions that were in this area had to be shot. Uh, there are still some leopards in this area but they're almost impossible to find. There used to be rhinoceros in this area too when it was much more savanna-like. The animals most likely to be found in this area now are uh, primates, uh, elephants, and uh, forest buffalo, uh, none of which the local people are terribly inclined to hunt. Forest buffalo are the wimpy cousin of the uh, Cape buffalo, but if you happen to be on foot, you probably don't want to uh, uh, stir one up. We're going to be flying from Brazzaville uh, to a national park far to the north called Ozala. And this is so remote that the traditionally the Bantu-speaking Africans didn't penetrate this area. The local natives here are pygmies. We'll be visiting three camps at Ozawa. The lodges are located where those three little house symbols are. Gabon is immediately to the west and the Cameroons are to the north. The Naga camp is just outside the national park where that green symbol is. The advantage of being outside the park uh, is that you can wander around at night and nobody much cares. Nobody stops you. In contrast, the Mboko camp is actually inside of the park uh, and on a watercrow course. 
Uh, and so you're not allowed to go wandering around at night. There's no telling what you could bump into. The Longo Camp uh, is now where that green symbol is. It's on the same water course as the Mboko. And uh, this one is uh, very similar in some uh, ways. Getting to any location from any location is best done on the river. The terrain here is basically of two types. There is rainforest, of course. You would expect that back here. Uh, and there is some savanna. Uh, the savanna is a bit uh, patchy. Originally, this area had a great deal more savanna than it uh, does today, and the rainforests have been expanding. Um, the locals want to keep those savannas that they do have, and the result of that is that they do a certain amount of burning in order to keep the rainforest from absorbing all of the savannas. Now this is one such controlled burn, although in this part of the world, controlled burn is probably hyperbole. But this is primarily rainforest, and it does rain. One of the things I really like to do is to uh, have a night game drive uh, where you uh, drive around the countryside and see if you can video uh, some animals that are out only at night. One of the first things that you think about when you think about uh, night animals, especially night mammals, are bats. And this is a fruit bat having lunch or maybe it's breakfast. Certainly one of the uh, first groups of night primates uh, that you think about, uh, for Africa at least, are bush babies. Uh, these are uh, basically uh, primitive monkeys, if you will, uh, very primitive. Um, and uh, they're very active at night. Uh, insects are one of those things that uh, they tend to eat. And they move very rapidly from tree to tree. Uh, usually about all that you get is eye shine bouncing from one tree to the other. In the lower left though, that's uh, not a bush baby. Although at a distance, of course it looks somewhat similar, it's a little mammal. But take a look at the length of the tail. It really, really stretches out. You're going to be able to see this animal better in the next clip. It's actually a civet, and the civet would like to get hold of the bush baby if it could because the civet is a carnivore. 
It used to be called a civet cat pretty frequently, but it's no cat. It is probably uh, closer related to uh, meerkats, which are also not cats, or possibly even mongoose. Uh, this one uh, appears to be a little bit sleepy, or possibly it's the white light that is bothering the civet. Um, in any event, he's got his eyes closed. I've discovered that uh, guides seem to like to use a white spotlight because uh, people can see the animals easier and the guides can find them easier. But it does affect the animals. Uh, they're unlikely to be exhibiting their natural behavior, be uncomfortable, and leave the scene. I had never even heard of this animal before. It's a poto. In some English-speaking parts of Africa, it's called a softly, softly. Um, it was first identified by William Bozeman uh, in 1704, uh, but this is related to a slow loris. And like lorises, uh, the saliva of the poto uh, is mildly venomous. It uh, tends to keep you from coagulating. They also have a pretty good bite, so despite the fact they're slow, I wouldn't recommend one as a pet. Apparently the poto can live to the ripe old age of 26 years old, which I find remarkable for such a small animal. But it's probably the slow heartbeat that helps. When I'm out on uh, night uh, game drives, I often uh, talk to the uh, a spotter uh, about using a, uh, a red filter on his white light or uh, perhaps even uh, infrared. I prefer infrared, uh, but uh, the red light uh, is something that the spotter can also see and uh, that helps him to locate the animal for me. The red light doesn't bother the animals quite as much. The problem with it is that it doesn't penetrate the darkness quite as far as the white light does. Turn off your engine. No, don't do that. In it's this cute. case, we're using a red filtered spotlight, something that the spotter can see and that the animals have a little bit of difficulty seeing, and therefore they're not nearly as frightened by it. These happen to be hyenas and they've fed well recently. Their tummies are full. They probably killed themselves a buffalo someplace. They don't know what to do. Uh, these animals would, if this were a white light, have zipped off into the grass already and you would not see them. But they're actually intrigued here by the red light and they want to approach it to see just exactly what it is. As a matter of fact, they got so close that I told the spotter that if they got too close, she should start the engine so that the animals would uh, not be inclined to uh, get in the vehicle with us. If he gets too close, turn on the engine. While we're watching this uh, second hyena in the road, um, the first one that had approached the vehicle had moved off to the gra in the grass uh, out to our right and was just watching us there and not doing very much. Uh, this hyena eventually moves off towards us and then off into the grass following essentially the same path 
And this isn't the only time we had that experience. A few days earlier, we had done almost exactly the same thing with some young hyenas. While going cross country uh, through the savanna, we had a uh, familiar experience. A tire blew out and uh, had to be replaced. It's a fairly common thing on safari. As a result, you get the uh, natural yearning uh, to do things the old-fashioned way, to go by boat up an African river. they come back tonight. Whenever that happens to me, I always make a point of putting my head under the covers. What's that? A laughing hyena. What is he laughing at?
Now primarily what people visit Osala to, uh, to see are primates. Um, we're going to be starting off with monkeys, but it's really apes that they're looking for. The monkeys that you see here are fairly common. They haven't been hunted, but they are a little bit skittish. Now one way that you can tell a monkey from an ape is that no ape has a tail. So if you see a primate with a tail, uh, you can be pretty sure it's not an ape. Um, the tails on old world monkeys tend to be hanging straight down, or at least they're not prehensile. Prehensile tails are limited to monkeys in the new world. So if you see a monkey hanging by its tail, you'll know that that's not an old world monkey. On the other hand, uh, some monkeys don't have tails. So how do you tell the difference between a, a monkey that doesn't have a tail and an ape? Well, you look at the shoulder because an ape will have a rotating shoulder. Uh, monkeys, when they're in the trees, walk along the top of the branches as though they were cats or something. Uh, but apes can swing using their arms underneath the branches. So the animals that you see here are clearly old world monkeys because they do have tails and because those tails are obviously not prehensile. Both monkeys and apes tend to live in family groups of one size or another. Apes usually in smaller family groups, but monkey family groups uh, can be quite large. Ozala has a, a number of different kinds of monkeys. There's the gray cheek mangabee and the putty nosed monkey. Most of the ones that you've seen were putty nosed monkeys. And uh, Debraza's monkey. Uh, also, there's a mustached monkey. And later on, we're going to be taking a look at some colobus. Now, although most monkeys, including the putty nosed uh, monkeys, uh, tend to live in groups, I do know of one putty nosed monkey named Bob uh, who apparently is pretty single. And he hangs out at one of the lodges. The folks at the lodge say that they've never fed Bob and frequently he goes away for a day or two but he usually comes back. So why Bob hangs around the lodge is not entirely clear. It may be that he's just lonely for other primates and maybe he just could never find a, a group of putty nose monkeys that he could fit in with. In any event, uh, this is Bob. Uh, he had been absent from the lodge for a couple of days, but he came back for a short visit while I was there. Hey, Bob is wounded on his left arm. He must have been out fighting with someone. About a decade ago, scientists announced that uh, putty-nosed monkeys uh, could actually speak in sentences using syntax. Uh, before that time, it was largely assumed that uh, only humans did that. Putty nosed monkeys have one alarm call for leopards and a separate alarm call that sounds quite different uh, for hawks and eagles. Uh, if they combine the two of them, uh, basically it means something entirely different like, let's get out of here. We fight. We fight. The black and white colobus monkeys are a fairly large monkey. Uh, they're very uh, distinctive. And they're pretty widespread over Africa, so any place that you go, you're very likely to see one. These colobus monkeys are a little bit camera shy, but the next colobus monkey is a real poser. He seems to love to get his photograph taken. I'm not 
These are all the same monkey. He just keeps changing his pose until uh, you find a pose that you particularly like to photograph, and he, then he'll let you do it. In addition to gorillas, this area also has common chimpanzees. There are two basic types of chimpanzee, the bonobo or dwarf chimpanzee and the common chimpanzee. The common chimpanzee is north of the Congo River and the bonobo is south of the river. In this particular area, the kind of common chimpanzee that they have is the central chimpanzee. The chimpanzees I'd seen in the past were mostly eastern chimpanzees. The bonobos are smaller and less aggressive uh, than the common chimpanzee. In fact, uh, they're frequently referred to as the hippies of the chimpanzee world. Uh, they like to make love instead of war. There is also a type of chimpanzee, eastern chimpanzee, uh, that is referred to as a billy ape uh, because it lives in the billy forest. It's a very large chimpanzee. Not very much is known about it. It's about the size of a human being. This next is a central uh, chimpanzee. Um, now these chimpanzees are not habituated and so the result is if you get it within a hundred yards of them they're gone. Like me to try and get a photo for you, Ingrid? This is one of those situations where the uh, subject of the photography was as curious about the photographer as the photographers were about the subject. Did you ever wonder where the word gorilla comes from? Well, the story goes back a long ways. The fact of the matter is that 
Necho II was pharaoh of Egypt at one time, and he hired the Phoenicians, who were the world's greatest sailors, to go around Africa. They went out through the Red Sea, and they came back through the Pillars of Hercules, which we call Gibraltar today. The trip took them a couple of years. And we're pretty sure that that story is true for the very reason that the Greeks didn't believe it. You see, the Phoenicians reported that at some point along their trip, the sun appeared to be in the northern part of the sky instead of in the southern part. Now the Greeks knew that that never happened. The sun was always in the south. But today we know that when you go below the equator, as the Phoenicians apparently did, the sun does appear to be in the north. Now, about a hundred years after that, uh, in about the fifth century BC, there was a Phoenician sailing for Carthage, uh, General Hanno the Navigator. And Hanno took 60 ships and uh, if you figure about 50 people per ship, you're talking about uh, several thousand people. And he went around down the scope of the side of Africa. And the reason that he did that was to establish uh, colonies. But when he got to the, near the end of his trip, as far down the coast of Africa as he intended to go, he discovered something very interesting. What he discovered, the local people called gorillas, and he reported that they were very hairy people. Now, we're not sure just exactly what Hanno discovered. We don't know if they were chimpanzees, we don't know if they were gorillas, we don't know if they were some kind of other ape, or if they were really just hairy people. But in the 19th century, uh, when people started uh, discovering uh, actual gorillas in, in Africa, they remembered the name that Hanno gave those animals. It's a good day for going to sea Hanno the navigator said to me There's an open sky and a steady breeze Up beyond the pillars of Hercules Above the foam kissed waves, seagulls scream. Up in the masts of our trireme, and it's a good day for going to sea. Hanno the navigator said to me, Water, water, from horizon to horizon. Beyond all maps and charts Down along the coast of Africa The first Phoenicians on the speech While the monkeys jib around the parakeets screech the Strangest women run wild down there Covered head to toe in fur and hair They fight like demons, better let them be Hanno the navigator said to me Whoa Water From horizon to horizon All I see is water Osman pull and cuss and sweat Underneath this creaking deck At night I hear the star is told Strong through storms and weak for gold that stands like an azure pearl Here in the middle of the known world And it's a good day for going to sea Hannah the navigator said to me Water, water From horizon to horizon All I see is water, water
It's a good day for going to sea. Hannah the navigator said to me. There are two basic types of gorillas, uh, western and eastern. It's the western gorilla that you most often see in zoos. Eastern gorillas are much more rare. And it's the mountain gorilla that is a type of eastern gorilla. Here, the little red dots are the uh, mountain gorillas, and the green areas are eastern gorillas. But what we're interested in is in the blue areas. Those are western lowland gorillas. And the arrow points to where we are. In 2008, the Wildlife Conservation Society did a survey in this area. They located 125,000 gorillas that had been unaccounted for. Those numbers have been declining, but maybe not for the reasons that you'd expect. About 5% of the uh, gorilla deaths can be attributed to poaching but a third of the deaths are probably caused by Ebola. Gorillas are very susceptible to Ebola, and Ebola is in this area. In the recent past, uh, Ebola has in fact wiped out entire gorilla populations in localized areas. So now we're looking for Western lowland gorillas. Scientific name, gorilla, gorilla, gorilla. And we're looking for signs. Here's a sign right here. Oh, and by the way, this is the gorilla you're most likely to see in a zoo. One of the best places to find gorillas is at the salad bar. And uh, that is in fact where I am right now. Those large leaf plants uh, tend to be one of the gorilla's favorite foods. And incidentally, finding a gorilla generally requires a certain amount of walking, sometimes quite a bit of it, sometimes many hours. But uh, green stuff is not the only thing that uh, the gorillas eat. Uh, this red uh, fruit on the ground, that's a, a residue of uh, a fruit that a gorilla has eaten. And there are other things that gorillas eat as well and sometimes they're concentrated in a particular area. And those areas tend to have uh, cameras, uh, game cameras uh, attached to trees uh, that go off whenever there's movement around them. And uh, that's how the uh, rangers uh, find out what kind of activity there is in a particular area. By the way, poachers uh, don't particularly like camera traps and uh, they have a tendency to destroy or vandalize them. I know very little about. Yes, but what you're telling me is you think it's something the gorillas did. I do think it is something that the gorillas did. Um, and if you're not in the picture, I can't tell what size the hole is. <laughs> there you are. Um, the tracks that we found earlier, the gorillas were here in the last day or two. And the trail that I did two days ago came straight past here. Mm. And this hole was not here. And this hole was dug yesterday or the day before, probably early yesterday or the day before, before the rain we had yesterday. Still quite quite wet because of the shade. But um, gorillas will dig holes like this to, to find roots. And it's only here in Odzala that, that we have gorillas that dig for roots. Nowhere else in, in the world, nowhere else in Africa do, do gorillas dig for roots. Well, I find that somewhat surprising. I would have thought that uh, all gorillas would, would dig for roots. Um, on the scale that we have here, where gorillas will, will create little clearings around trees in the forest, mm -hmm. that is unique to here. Gorillas in other places will sometimes, if there's an exposed root from a, a hog or something coming through and digging it up, 
they might pick it up and eat it. But here, between a few kilometers west of here, um, well, northwest of here, to about 15 to 20 kilometers southeast of here, is the only known place where gorillas actively open up areas to dig for roots. And something like this would be gorillas excavating to find out if there's a good root source here. So they can come back here. Obviously, you can have a look at the size of this hole, how deep it is. It, um, it shows you how valuable the roots are to them. Whether it's the, um, the sugar or uh, the taste, or if it's medicinal, that is something we don't know yet. Um, I do know that these things are in the lab as we speak. And in the next, hopefully, three months, uh, the paper will be published and we will know. That's what I know about this whole... <laughs> <laughs> As we moved through the forest, we came upon a gorilla nest. Silly postupidic? If, if, C'est le silly postupidic? Le? T'as compris? C'est le matelas. Le matelas, oui. my guide, uh, Alain, to uh, get into the uh, gorilla bed so that we could see in the uh, uh, filming uh, about what size it happens to be. Uh, he's a, a little reluctant to do that, uh, he's slightly embarrassed, because you see, uh, gorillas normally defecate in their beds uh, when they leave them, and uh, for that reason and probably others, they don't go back to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he's a little ginger about uh, precisely where he's no, um, putting his posterior. Il ne fait pas les crottes à l'intérieur. Normalement, oui. Il le fait ici aussi. Maintenant ouais. Non. <rire> Je pensais que ce n'était pas le cas. Ouais. Normalement, euh, c'est le matin, on a les gorilles. Mm. Défiqué. Oui, oui. c'est ça. Mm. Dans le nid. Dans le lit. <rire> ah. Il y en a un autre, là. You may have noticed that uh, Lan, uh, my guide, has uh, some rose clippers with him that he uses to trim the shrubbery back. Uh, he does that in order to keep the, uh, the trails clear. And he uses the uh, rose clippers instead of the machete uh, for small jobs, largely because uh, it's much more quiet uh, than using the machete. When we get close to the gorillas, we have to go in disguise as medical surgeons. I know. 
If you run... He'll chase me, I know. I've read the books. <laughs> Where'd you go? I ran away. Sorry. Unlike that gorilla, uh, my gorillas were habituated and uh, well behaved. Uh, there were two basic groups, uh, one by, led by the silverback Jupiter and the other one by the silverback Neptune. And basically, we're going to be taking a look at Jupiter's family first and then switching over to Neptune. Some of the noise that you hear in the background uh, is some of the uh, boys trying to sort out who is the top gorilla uh, just below the silverback. When you see one of the gorillas here eating something that could be ants, it is ants uh, that they're eating, and uh, Jupiter is also able to get his because the ants are uh, on the ground floor as well as up in the trees. And that's not a problem for him. Later on when we take a look at Neptune, you'll see that his family uh, is eating more fruit up in the trees. Well, Neptune is a big silverback, and he has difficulty getting up in the trees, and so he uh, is down at the base of the trees. You may hear some grunting or something, and he's asking uh, for his family to send him down some fruit, and reluctantly, they do so. Now, after I left, uh, in fact, several days after I left, I was told that Neptune was up in the tree uh, getting fruit for himself, he apparently wasn't getting enough by asking his relatives. And he fell out of the tree. Now, I haven't heard whether or not he was injured in that fall. The gorillas are only allowed to be visited once a day and only for about an hour so that they're not too stressed. And our time is about up. But before we go, take special notice of the fact that there is an infant in both the upper and lower left quadrants of the video.
Now focus on the baby in the upper left. Mom is trying to hide her infant from the uh, dangerous predators below, but uh, her baby wants to have a look in the worst way. This massive creature is said to be twice the size of an elephant. They talk about an animal between 30 to 70 feet in length. With Long, thin neck, bulbous body, and the heavy tail, the elephant-like legs. An animal thought to have been extinct for centuries. In fact, I think I'd feel safer in Jurassic Park. Now, Monster Quest travels to the wildest continent to search for the last living dinosaur. Whoa. It's all up and down like this. Look at that. What? Wow, what is that? And there are these footprints, uh, huge footprints. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers. On Monster Quest. Africa, the cradle of mankind. This continent contains some of the world's most magnificent wildlife, from the gorilla and elephant to giraffe and gazelle. Among this vast wilderness, much of it unexplored, some believe there could be a monster that is a living relic hidden deep in the jungle. This huge creature is said to prowl the land and lurk beneath inland waters. Natives call it Michele Mbembe, one that stops the flow of rivers. A heavy armored uh, side, scales, uh, a fringe of scales down the back. Footprints of the order of three feet in circumference. He always came out of the cave to, 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 to find food. The people call this animal Mokeli and Bembe. Do -mi -so -do -mi. Si, re, si, mi, 
You've heard of the Loch Ness Monster and the legendary North American Bigfoot. Now meet Mokele Mbembe, Africa's very own mythical monster. The ancient creature that's been making a splash worldwide since literally blocker of rivers, thought by some scientists to fit the description of a plesiosaur, a prehistoric marine reptile that died out with the dinosaurs. Although dismissed by many as scientific... Originally reported by missionaries more than a hundred years ago, sightings of this legendary beast have risen over the last few years as extensive deforestation thins out the once impenetrable jungle. Many of the early accounts of the flora and fauna of West and Central Africa came from missionaries and explorers. In 1776, the Abbey Levine Bonaventure Proyar wrote in the history of Luongo, Kakanga, and other kingdoms in Africa about a group of French missionaries who had found the tracks of an enormous unknown animal in the jungle. Pinkerton's translation, published in 1914, reads, it must be monstrous. The prints of its claws are seen upon the earth and formed an impression on it of about three feet in circumference. In observing the posture and disposition of the footprints, they concluded that it did not run this part of the way and that it carried its claws at a distance of seven or eight feet, one from the other. Prints this large could only have been made by an animal the size of an elephant, but elephants do not possess clawed toes. What kind of monster was it? New clues were to come as more reports began to emerge from Africa about this mystery monster. There wasn't very much more uh, discussion about giant lizards or monsters in the Congo until about the uh, early 20th century. But very early in the 20th century, some respected uh, explorers and researchers did start discussing the possibility. Hagenbeck, who was director of the Hamburg Zoo, has been acclaimed as one of the greatest animal collectors of all time. In his book, Beasts and Men, published in 1912, he wrote, On the walls of certain caverns in Central Africa, there are to be found actual drawings of this strange creature. From what I have heard of the animal, it seems to me that it can only be some kind of dinosaur, seemingly akin to the Brontosaurus. As the stories come from so many different sources, and all tend to substantiate each other, I am almost convinced that some such reptile must still be in existence. In 1913, the German government decided to survey its then colony of Cameroon and chose Captain Friar von Stein Zulausnitz to lead the expedition. Von Stein included the following fascinating report on a creature, quote, very much feared by the Negroes of certain parts of the territory of the Congo, the Lower Yabangi, the Sangha, and the Ikalemba rivers. They called the animal Mokele Mbembe. The animal is said to be of a brownish gray color, its size approximating that of an elephant. It is said to have a long and very flexible neck. Some spoke of a long, muscular tail like that of an alligator. Canoes coming near it are said to be doomed. The animals are said to attack the vessels at once and to kill the crews, but without eating the bodies. The creature is said to live in the caves that have been washed out by the river in the clay of its shores at shark bends. It is said to climb the shore even in daytime in search of its food. Its diet is said to be entirely vegetable. One of the most interesting books, uh, though not written by a very reputable uh, author, uh, is The Traitor Horn. He wrote a book called Traitor Horn, A Young Man's Astounding Adventures in 19th Century Equatorial Africa, detailing his journeys into jungles teeming with buffalo, gorillas, man-eating leopards, serpents, and headhunters. Aye, and behind the Cameroons there's things living we know nothing about. I could have made books about many things. The Jaganini, they say, is still in the swamps and rivers. Giant diver, it means. Comes out of the water and devours people. Old men will tell you what their grandfathers saw, but they still believe it's there. Same as the Amali, I've always taken it to be. 
I've seen the Amali's footprint, about the size of a good frying pan in circumference and three claws instead of five. There's been something here that I wanted to show you. This is a book, The Traitor Horn, written by, well, the name on the book is Alfred Aloysius Horn. But in fact, he was born Aloysius Smith. He was thrown out of boarding school, ran away to Africa to trade ivory. And that's what he did. This was in the late 19th century, and he had wonderful adventures with uh, gorillas and elephants and buffalo. But his most interesting uh, adventure was in uh, liberating an Isorga princess. Uh, actually, she was a, a white girl and uh, sort of a white goddess, if you uh, want to use that term. And uh, if you're familiar with the ancient Roman custom of Vestal Virgins, that's kind of what she was, and she wanted to get away. In liberating her, he also took uh, an eye of an idol, which was a diamond, and stole that as well. At the time that he was discovered, Horn was uh, basically on welfare in South Africa, although he had had a fascinating life even meeting Cecil Rhodes, and he enjoyed telling people those stories. Now this book takes place in West Africa. But in 1931, four years after this book came out, they came out with a movie, The Traitor Horn. The Traitor Horn movie takes place in East Africa. He comes up through Kenya up into Uganda, but otherwise the storyline about the Asarga princess is pretty similar. The movie The Traitor Horn was the first full-length movie that was shot in Africa that was not a documentary. Uh, and it was also a, a talkie, so it has sound with it. And you probably have already recognized the title music. Uh, it's the Cannibal's Carnival. And it's the same title music that Johnny Weissmuller used in the Tarzan pictures. Now, that's not an accident. The outtakes from Trader Horn uh, are continually used uh, in the Johnny Weissmuller series. Trader Horn is played by Harry Carey. Uh, the white goddess is played by Edwina Booth. That's not her actual name. Edwin Booth was uh, her favorite uncle, so she used that as her stage name. And Duncan Ronaldo uh, is the uh, romantic lead. She was hot stuff in her days, uh, and this is a pre-code movie, uh, and so it's relatively risque. Edwina was said not to only be hot stuff on screen, but off screen as well. And she is said to have had a torrid love affair with uh, Duncan Ronaldo just off the set. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Duncan's wife sued her later for alienation of affection. In the lower right, Harry Carey does actually become perilously close to losing a foot to a crocodile. And in this entire movie, Edwina does not speak a single word of English, although she does come down with a disease that ends her career, probably malaria. This may not look like an auspicious beginning uh, for their relationship, uh, but uh, Edwina does eventually uh, help them to escape and she goes with them. In the end, Ranchero, played by Mutia, 
sacrifices himself to save his friends. Now the interesting thing is that if you uh, listen to the Tarzan movies, the Johnny Weissmuller Tarzan movies closely, you'll see that Tarzan is on the Mutia escarpment. The escarpment is named after this actor. Now there is one other thing in the movie that you probably wouldn't expect, and that is there was someone killed in the movie by a, a charging rhinoceros, and that footage is included in the movie. So where you see the rhinoceros killing a person, that happens to be a real event, although they have uh, made it so that it looks like perhaps it's not. Now getting back to the book from the movie, this is something that's actually in Trader Horn's book. It's a hand-drawn uh, map of places that he was. And one of the things that you can see is that Brazzaville is pretty squarely on the map. That means that he was mostly in the Republic of the Congo more than he was the Cameroons. After Trader Horn, many people told Mokeli and Bimbi stories, but maybe one of the best ones was told by uh, Pastor Eugene Thomas. Um, around 1960, 59 or 60, uh, down in the Lake Tele region, uh, there were some uh, tribesmen fishing, pygmies fishing, uh, and they were being disturbed by Mokeli and Bimbe's. And so in order to keep the uh, animals at bay, uh, they uh, put some stakes uh, into the river that the Mokeli and Bimbe's used to enter the lake. And uh, one day, one of the animals trying to uh, get through impaled itself on the stake barrier and uh, the, the natives uh, killed it, speared it to death, and ate it. Uh, all of the natives subsequently died who ate the Mokeli and Bimbe. In 1980, Arthur C. Clarke picked up the story and broadcast it on one of his episodes. The animal is described as being as big as an elephant or at least as big as a hippopotamus. It has a long head and neck and a long tail. It, is, uh, it has feet that are like a hippopotamus, but it has three claws on each of these feet. Every kind of animal uh, that we can think of that is alive today doesn't fit this picture. The closest uh, it, it comes to, and amazing as this may seem, is a dinosaur that is extinct perhaps 65 to 70 million years. It does have an almost perfect resemblance to uh, certain types of dinosaurs, particularly the three-clawed footprint. That is, that's almost the trademark of certain long-necked dinosaurs. What really got me onto this was in 1976, I had a grant from the Explorers Club in New York to study rainforest crocodiles in the Gabon, which is a country immediately to the west of Congo. And since I had read about these reports, I decided to see if I could come across any similar information. So among the Fang tribesmen, I tried a little, you might say, flashcard test. I first of all showed them pictures of five animals which are reasonably common in the Gabon jungles. And in each case, I would say, Do you, can you recognize this animal? What is it? He says, sure, of course, that's an elephant, that's a gorilla, that's a leopard, etc. These things live around here in the jungle. We know them. Then just as a control test, I showed him a picture of a bear. Now, there are no bear in Africa, so far as we know. And I said, do you know that animal? He said, no, we've never seen this. That, that animal will not live around here. Then, just matter-of-factly, I showed him this. It's a picture of a Diplodocus from a children's book on dinosaurs. I said, do you know that animal? And in several different villages, representing at least two different cultural groups, I would get consistent answers. Yes, that's the Nyamala. We know that animal. It lives back in the deep lakes, deep in the jungles. In the early 1980s, Mackle made two expeditions to Africa. He was able to collect enough eyewitness testimony to convince him a dinosaur-like creature still lived in the jungle. What impressed me was that the descriptions matched. That is an animal of the order of 25 to 30 feet, uh, 
eight, nine, ten meters in length, reddish in color, with a frill on the back of the neck, a long head neck that looked snake-like. Mackle described the animal as reptilian. They described them as being able to submerge as a crocodile would, but being made, and they did come out on land most of the time. There just isn't anything like it at all. Now, subsequent to the uh, Mackle expedition, uh, there were a number of other expeditions that occurred, mostly in the 1980s. There was a British one, a Dutch, uh, and Japanese. There were a flurry of books written, uh, but there were no good photos, uh, no good video, uh, no good hard physical evidence that there was any kind of a dinosaur in the Congo. Now one thing that did turn up that was kind of interesting is that some uh, pygmies apparently identify Mokeli and Bembe with a rhinoceros. Now there had been rhinoceros in this area before, but for as far as we can tell, there are no rhinoceros in this neighborhood these days. The rhino footprint uh, does have three toes, but it's much smaller than the Mokeli Mbembe footprint. About a decade ago, there were a number of TV shows that uh, specialized uh, in monsters, and uh, several of them uh, did go after Mokeli and Bimbe, including Monster Quest, Beast Hunter, and uh, Destination Truth with uh, Josh Gates. Now, what do we know about Mokeli and Bimbe? Well, the stories are that he's some sort of a reptile, probably a dinosaur. It looks an awful lot like a sauropod, but he spends a great deal of time in the water. Um, there are some drawings of him, uh, and there are a lot of stories, but there's virtually no physical evidence. The animal is supposed to be a vegetarian, but it can be very vicious has a tendency to kill hippopotamus that are in the area and it overturns canoes. Now as dinosaurs go, Mokeli and Bembe isn't very large. Uh, this is a pygmy next to Mokeli and Bembe and you can see they're both quite small. Mokeli and Bembe is often found on land and he uh, likes to graze on uh, vines, uh, especially flowering vines, at various times of the year. In fact, it seems to be his major source of food. And we also know that the animal is in the Republic of the Congo and neighboring areas. In fact, the hot spot appears to be Lake Telly. Now, Lake Telly is one of those places that's extremely difficult to get to but it's not terribly far from where we are. Lake Telly is just a little bit to the east of the three lodges where we're staying. Now one of the most compelling proofs that uh, uh, Malkeli and Bimbe exists is the fact that you can find him in the Tarzan cartoon strip. Obviously it wouldn't have been put in print if he didn't exist. So it's time now for us to go out looking for Mokeli and Bimbe in his natural habitat. So our first move here is to head out into the swamp and the uh, easiest way, the best way, the traditional way to get there uh, is by river. Uh, we're going to be taking uh, some kayaks at least part of the way and then when the water gets too shallow, we're going to have to slog our way in. On our way in, we have our uh, encounter, the one of the many encounters, uh, with a large, uh, well, the usual megafauna that you would find uh, in this area. 
uh, of the bovine kind. Now this thing happens to be a bull and it's a water buffalo, a forest buffalo, and they are notoriously ill-tempered. As the water gets shallow, we have to tie up the kayaks because the rest of the way in is going to be a slog through the swamp. Heading as we're about to head up uh, the stream, just want to give you a quick briefing. Hi, my name's Alon Cassidy. I will be your guide for the next few days. Um, this area here is called Langobai. This is the lowest section of Langobai. I will get into explaining what a bai is a little later. But uh, Langobai is divided into three parts, basically an clearing that's divided into three parts. This is the lowest one that connects up with the Likoli River. The middle section is the biggest section and we're about to head into that. And then the last section, the third section, is pretty is this sort of smallish section, but it's the same size as here really. And that is the section where we have the lodge. So we need to just walk up this stream, avoiding a few buffaloes and going through some mud, but mostly water up to Lango camp and uh, in a straight line it is about a kilometer point two, so 1200 meters should take us about an hour and a half <laughs> if that gives you any indication of the speed we'll be traveling <laughs> um, there is a very good chance that we come in contact with buffaloes on this walk or other dangerous games like elephant or sititunga Please, we want to stay together at all times. We don't want to spread out as a group, we want to stick together. And if we do come across any, any situation, any dangerous situation, I will give you an instruction, something like, come to me, get behind that tree, move this way, move that way, follow that path. Please obey this instruction as quickly and efficiently as possible. This way we'll be able to avoid any injuries and hopefully get a good sighting it as well. Um, any questions so far? Just in case you're wondering, this is the resident bull elephant, and he's headed toward the bay as well. As a matter of fact, it's getting close to night, and it's going to go dark very shortly, and uh, that is rain that you hear. This bull is very used to people. He's uh, very placid, easy to get along with. And uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, you couldn't ask for more uh, in a wildlife uh, viewing. Doesn't mind getting his picture taken. Now this is the bye at night. 
Now, a buy is, in a sense, artificial, but it's not made by people, it's made by elephants. What happens is the elephants have gone in there and they have cleared out the trees. They've done that for a particular reason. There's salt here. And so at night, the elephants come in and you can uh, see them in the darkness uh, kick away the silt or use their trunks kind of like a, uh, a leaf blower to blow the silt away and then to drink up some of the salt water. That is why the elephants come here. Now this video was taken with my infrared spotlight. You're not allowed to put a white light or probably even a filtered light uh, on the by at night because it disturbs the animals. But the animals can't see the infrared spotlight. Now incidentally I've gone to a split screen here so that you've uh, got some uh, video on the top and some on the bottom of the elephants at night in the by. I think you can see pretty clearly in this video that there are at least four elephants in that location right now. My schedule in the swamp was uh, uh, pretty much the same almost every day. I uh, went uh, on a uh, night safari at uh, 4.30 a.m. We got back around uh, 6 o'clock in the morning for uh, breakfast and by 7 we were out on a, uh, a walk. So, um, here we have a nice big park. We call this an elephant boulevard. It looks a bit like a string but um, that's because all the elephants over the last few hundred years that have walked up and down here have created enough of a pathway for water to flow, flow through. Otherwise, this whole area would just be a, a big swamp, a big marsh. And if you look on the left hand side and if you look on the right hand side, you'll see you've got these rather tall, straight trees which have big, broad leaves. These are um, known as Mitrogena ciliata, wonderful um, scientific name, but in guiding terms we often call them swamp trees, because if you try and walk to the base of one, you will be knee deep in mud, sometimes more. And as we walk along this elephant boulevard, you just watch out on the sides see lots of tracks, elephants coming up and down, buffaloes, sometimes hogs. The first time I saw leopard tracks was, and the first time seeing leopard tracks in the Zara was along this path as well. Sounds like we're going to have a bit of weather. Right, there we go. Eco-monitors from African parks. And they've just come back from a, a monitoring session at a new buy that they found. They found new buy, a relative most, but two years since they, they discovered it. And these uh, three guys, are, these guys are the eco-monitors, not the eco-guards. So they, they work with the research team and they go out and they monitor the buys or they collect data and they do transact. Very, very well knowledge in the forest. And three of the four of them have taught me a lot in the forest. Okay. And I've worked a lot with those guys, so very deep respect for them. As you come more forward, it becomes shallower.
we have a bit of a problem here. Uh, this forest buffalo, uh, this bull, uh, does not want us to continue in the direction that we need to go in order to get back to the lodge. And it's uh, going to be getting late soon, uh, going to be getting dark, and you certainly don't want to be out in the swamp at night. Well, it looks as if uh, we've won the uh, battle of the wills here for a second, but then the bull changes his mind. Alan is uh, trying to put pressure on the bull to convince it to move along. Eventually, Alan uh, wins his argument with the with the bull, and we do make it back to the uh, lodge, and. Uh, before you go back into the lodge, of course, you uh, need to uh, go through the washing, the, uh, the ritual of the washing of the shoes. Well, we didn't find Mokeli and Bembe, but he could still be here somewhere. It's a large forest. <laughs> 